J.R. Eastman from First Community Mortgage, Blake Pro from Liberty Mutual Insurance, Lisa Turner is in the back, she's uh, with Wataga Title, and Jason Peterson with Cornerstone Home Inspection will be along shortly. And what we try to do is we try to actually walk you through the whole home buying process from start to finish. If you've bought a home before, there's been some laws that have changed in the last five or six years that may not have been in place when you bought a house the first time. So we kind of show you what to expect. We kind of show you where there's potential downfalls, where there's potential places to, where there may be a stress situation. We try to show you all that. That way you know what you're getting into up front. That way when we tell you, hey, we're about to come into one of these situations, you're gonna go, okay, we already know what's going on. He's already told us this. So that's, that's where we are. So the very first step in finding, go, going to buy a house is, guess what? Call a realtor. <laughs> And we're going to call you. We're going to call you. And we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about what your wants and needs are. But the biggest thing we're going to go is we're going to try to figure out what your monthly payment wants to be. Because when we find out what your monthly payment is going to be, it helps us when we call somebody like Jr. and tell them, hey, they want to be around this payment. Because it really, a lot of people go, well, I want to spend three hundred fifty thousand dollars with no idea what three hundred fifty thousand dollars payment is. They just say, I like three hundred fifty thousand dollars houses. That's what I want to buy. And then and my next question is, well, how much do you want your payment to be? Well, I want my payment to be about 800 bucks, but you're not buying a $350,000 house unless you're spending, putting a big down payment down. So I kind of just go through a qualifying thing with you. And I always meet all my clients face to face the first time. That way we can set expectations. So you set expectations for me, I set expectations for you. Everything's set up up front. That way there's no misunderstandings going forward. So the first one is, what do you want your monthly payment to be? Between the time I, you set up that face-to-face -face and the time that face-to-face -face meeting happens, I send you some, uh, to JR, and JR goes, hey, this is great, I'm glad to be working with you. Uh, Sean told me you wanted to spend about 900 bucks a month. Let's go ahead and get you pre-approved. And you're gonna have to give him several docs, and he'll go over what you're gonna have to give him to get you pre-approved and that way you're not just, there's three steps, pre-qualified, pre-approved, and loan commitment. Pre-qualification, I could literally take that iPad right there, write you a loan uh, qualification, it's worth it just about as much as the paper that it would be printed on. Because they don't know, they haven't seen your papers, they don't know if you're telling the truth, it's just totally worthless. Well, pre-approval, they've actually verified your income, they've verified your taxes, they've verified your credit, and we know when we go look at houses, that it's a good, we don't, we don't have to worry about any surprises. Because the last thing you want to do is get a week, two weeks before closing, and boom, surprise time. You don't want to have that. So that's what we try to do all the homework up front. It may take a little slower, it may be a more painstaking thing up front, but long term, it's going to be a lot less stress on you. So that's what we're trying to do. So when I hand you to JR, JR is going to go through all that. And I'm going to have JR come up and tell you his little part before he hands you back to me when the fun really begins. So JR, have at it. <laughs> on, the, on the front end, like Sean said, after, uh, after you kind of go over some basics with your real estate agent, give them an idea of, of what you're looking for, then we go in and pull credit. Um, nowadays, that's one of the first things that on the mortgage side that we have to do because very often your, uh, your credit score, your credit history will give me a really good idea of what programs to talk to you about. Um, there's no sense in me talking to you about a program that you can't qualify for. And on the, the opposite side of that, there's no need for me to talk to you about a, 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 uh, a program that may have a higher interest rate, but you've got great credit scores and don't need to go that direction. Um, so that's the first thing we narrow down what programs to talk to you about by full credit and then the, as Sean was saying the pre-qualifying part is we just do some basic math okay the, the, the front end of the process we pull credit look it over go over it with you to make sure that everything on there is accurate the credit scores and the credit history will kind of push us in a particular direction generally um, and then we'll do some income qualifying We'll go through and calculate what your monthly income is, compare that to your debts, and come up with what's called the debt to income ratio. Uh, different programs have different standards for your debt to income. Um, conventional loans, just as an example, their basic guidelines are that you have 36% of your income tied up in total debt, 
or that you have 26% uh, of your income tied up in a total house payment. So if you make 10,000 a month, you're gonna, the, the basic qualifying is that you can afford somewhere between a 2,600 and a $4,300 house payment. Back to Sean's, you know, $1.3 million house that he's got listed. Well, there's other products and other programs that will have higher debt to income ratio qualifying. Uh, that have more lenient underwriting guidelines and allow for lower credit scores. So after we pull your credit, we discuss it, go over it, kind of get a general idea of where you need to go as far as the pre-qualifying process goes. And then we start tying into that also, how much do you want to write a check for? If you saved up a down payment, are we trying to do it with little to nothing down? Uh, we've got programs available that do get you in for as little as, as, as nothing for a down payment. You still have closing costs you have to pay, and we can start talking about that. Um, that that part of the process is, as Sean was saying, is you're pre-qualified. Okay, you're pre-qualified up to a hundred and eighty-five thousand dollar house, and that's this loan program, that's this house payment, that's this cash out of pocket. If if the customer is okay with that, and that's about where they want to be, and it's doable, then we go back to Sean and say, okay, we're pre-qualified up to one eighty-five. Start looking for a house in that range. Uh, if we want to take it a step farther, we can go ahead and get you fully pre-approved. Um, when we get you pre-approved, we're going to need uh, 30 days of pay stubs. We're going to need two months of bank statements. We're going to need two years tax returns and W-2s or 1099s if you're self-employed. Um, retirement accounts. Uh, the, the, the list will vary depending upon the loan type and on your personal situation. Uh, if you've been divorced, we may need to get a copy of your divorce decree to show that you are receiving child support or, or paying child support. Um, if you have had a bankruptcy, we'll need to get a copy of bankruptcy paperwork. We go through all that to make sure there's no surprises. That Sean was saying, we don't want to get you guys out looking for a house, write a contract on a house, get all excited, spend money on, on a home inspection, find out, uh, oops, we didn't notice that. So that's the goal is to eliminate any of those issues. Um, if we have something, say you're buying a new construction house, or say you've got a situation that's just a little iffy, we can go ahead and, and Sean mentioned getting a commitment to lend. We as a company, uh, First Community, we're actually able to run you through the entire process, have you get in front of, not you personally, but your paperwork in front of a, a human underwriter to not only get you pre-approved, but literally get a commitment to lend. What that means is you're approved and there's nothing going to change that unless you go out and lose your job, the, you put a contract on a house and does not praise high enough. I mean, something drastic would really have to change for that commitment to lend to be, to be voided. Uh, so that does not happen all the time, simply because a lot of times it's not necessary. But we do have that as an option. New construction, sometimes a builder doesn't want to uh, doesn't want to start building a house until they know you're good to go. Uh, or with, you know, you get just a little a few bumps and bruises on your credit. Uh, or, or we're really kind of high on the debt to income ratio and we want to make sure we're okay. Then we can run you through a human underwriter and get a true commitment to lend. A lot of times that also comes into play with self-employed people. Just to make sure that you know, we calculated income correctly. Uh, so there's, there's three real, as Sean was saying, there's three real main processes that in that on the front end of your loan get you going. Um, when you're done getting the info for me and we have a really good idea of, of where you want to be versus where I can take you, uh, it, it get you a, a maximum that we can get you approved for, we get you probably a loan type or at least narrow down to one or two options and we may vary that just you know uh, start looking at a house and you may qualify for a rural development loan, which is a 100% program, so there's no down payment. But in order to qualify for that program, you have to be in a rural development area. Okay, so we'll keep that one in our back pocket, and we'll look in that area. But in case we don't find a house in a rural development area, we may also want to get you pre-approved on an FHA loan, as, just as an example. We get you pre-approved on a loan type or, or a couple of loan types. Um, we're comfortable with the cash out of pocket. We're kind of on the same page. We know where we're going, then we send you back to Sean um, for starting to get out there and, and heavily look for properties. Uh, and Sean, I'll let you 
talk about the, the house hunting process. Uh, all right. I've bought two houses in my life I know nothing about. <laughs> well, so I and the, or the agents that I've trained that are in the room, moving to Dutchweather, Florida, California, Texas, Kentucky, I got agents I've trained everywhere. I do things a little differently when I'm shopping for houses. Right? I teach them to do things differently when they're shopping for houses. The first thing is I need to know two things that you have to have at each person. If it's a husband or wife, whatever the dynamic is, I need two, two things from each that are non-negotiables. So if there's a husband and wife, I need four things. That way, because most likely, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll get out of that story. I got a past client that literally sent me an Excel spreadsheet that had 390 items on it. There is no way that I'm ever going to find a house that has 390 items on it. It's not going to happen. But if you, most people have a couple things that they just have to have. Like mine, when I bought my house, I had to have a three-car garage. Now the house I ended up buying didn't have the three-car garage. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> but, but, the ha but everybody's got this thing. Most, most women, not to sound sexist, most women want a really nice master bath and a really nice kitchen. So you, you have just two things that you just you got to have. So if those two things aren't, when we go house shopping, you tell me, hey, I want a really open kitchen with granite countertops, stainless steel appliances, uh, soft clothes drawers on the cabinets. I don't need to go look at a house that's got for mica and it's got vinyl floor all down and old white appliances. It's not what you want. I want to make sure that you get what you want when we're going to look for, because a house is supposed to be a blessing, and we want to make sure that it's blessing you by what you want. The other thing is, is I want to make sure that you are looking at what you want to look at. So I have a rule. I won't show you more than four houses at a time. Four days. So a total of 16 houses. The reason why that is, is because any more than four days, the average, or any more than four houses at a time, the average person is not retaining what the first house, every time you go after, one, after four, the average person can't remember what no, number one looks like. So you're going to go to number four, you go to number five, and you're going to go, Man, I don't remember what one, two, three mainstream even looked like. The average person can only retain four at a time. After we go to look at four houses, we'll set up appointments. Let's say we're going at two o'clock. We'll go to those four houses, and after that, we'll go back to my office, go to Starbucks, go to Dunkin' Donuts, go to the whatever places of your choice, and we'll actually talk about what those four houses. What did you like? What did you dislike? I give every one of my clients a notebook that says likes, dislikes, has the house. That way, it helps a little bit with that retention because as you're going through, you're writing down, man, I really liked that kitchen, but the backyard was too small. I didn't like the colors in the house, but I really, really liked the carpet. So that way you get to keep up with what your houses are. And when we will go sit down, you can actually say, hey, I really like this, or I really didn't like this, or this is good, or this is bad. And we'll talk about if you want to make an offer at that point. If not, we go the next day and we look at four more. If I haven't found you a house that you're looking at, that you seriously want to buy in 16 houses, I failed you. That means I've done a bad job. That means I need to go find you a different agent because I'm not doing you a service. So at 16 houses, I just say, I failed you, go buy. Not because it's you, it's me. Just like George Cassandra said. So, once we go and look at all the houses, when we get done, we go back to the, when you're ready to make an offer. We sit down, we look at the comparable sales in the market. Now the past two years, we have been in such a seller's market that houses were selling for over asking price. Let's say you had a $200,000 house, you were lucky to buy it at 210, 215, and every house was basically, this, the list price was just a, a leap to try to see where it would actually sell for. And I've got strategies that I'll sit down with you one-on-one -on -one to talk about how to win those multiple offer situations in that specific for that specific house. So it's, it, they may differ from house to house, but I can walk you through those strategies when we get there. Now, as of right now in our market, we're in a situation where the prices are actually kind of taking a level off. We're not going back to recession and prices bottoming out, but our prices literally increased like this over the past <clears> two years. They went up so fast, so quick, that it wasn't a natural, a nationwide average is about 4% appreciation per year every year. We appreciated it almost 30% the past two years. So, way out of bounds. But 
we're not going like this, we're just kind of doing that. So that being said, if anybody's watched the news today, Amazon just announced that they're moving five to 13,000 jobs to Nashville in an area that's already got a supply issue. There's, no house, there's not a lot of houses out there. So what that does is it pushes the market appreciation back up and it makes the system really high again. But we walk, like I said, we walk all that through. We show you what the comparables in the neighborhoods show. I can't tell, I'm not an appraiser, I can't tell you what a house is worth, but I can tell you a range. It should be worth somewhere in this range. We look at other houses. I actually show you pictures of the other houses you're comparing to, because it may be, hey, this house over here has got really, really remodeled. The house you're looking at is not really, really remodeled. It's not going to be worth as much as the one that's really, really remodeled. We write the contract out. It's a 10-page contract. Uh, it's got purchase price, it's got your deed name, it's got how long we're going to do a home inspection on, and we fill all this application, all this contract out. At that point, once the contract is accepted, we hand you back to JR, and JR goes through another little phase. One question, Sean, or one yes. clarification. Um, I know, because I know how wonderful you are, he's great at his job. You don't have how many times in all the years you've done this that you've not found a house for someone within your 16? I've never gone past six. I just wanted to let y'all know that that won't happen because it's yeah. just that good. But, but I try to make sure when we sit down at that face-to-face -face meeting to figure out what you want, I make sure that I have a good understanding of what you actually want. That way you're not out just looking at houses because the last thing you want to do on a Saturday <coughs> is look at houses all day long. It's boring. But if I know truly what you want, it helps me when I look at houses to truly find what you really want. And that's what, I mean, if that's what you really want, that's what I want to make sure you go into. So JR is going to talk to you about the post-contract. Yes, sir. In fact, you mentioned about Amazon that they want to make their hub in Nashville. How would it affect the prices? I Do think we're going to go I, high or, I think we're going to go higher. And uh, what I mean, Murfreesboro? Mur Murfreesboro, Murfreesboro is still Nashville's biggest suburb, so a lot of people move to Murfreesboro. And if you watch 24 Corridor and 41 Corridor going towards Nashville every day, it's the last place you want to sit at in the morning and the afternoon because people, so many people are commuting back and forth. I, I think it's going to have a major effect on our prices. I, I got told a, a, a great saying that is, is perfect is driving to you can buy. And that's what people are doing is they're starting Nashville, they're driving until they can buy. If they can't afford Murfreesboro, they're going to keep driving to Manchester. To Manchester. Yeah. If they can't afford Manchester, they'll hit Belmont. They drive until they can buy. And it's it's been happening for at least the 10, 12 years that I can think of. Right. So um, I think what I was reading today, or somebody was reading to me, sorry, uh, was that hiring was going to start mid-2019, so they got about six months before the, the hiring really starts. I mean, we, like I said, we already have a supply issue. I, I looked at the market this morning, there's, there's not a lot of houses even on the market. So once you drop five to 13,000 more people right back on top, I mean, supply and demand economics just shows when you have a great demand, prices go up. The, the other part of that is what the average consumer does not know is that um, if I were to go out today and buy a 100 acre farm and I want to make it into JR's subdivision, it'll be two years before I can put a house on a lot. Because of all the things you have to go through, it's two years before you put a, put a spade in the ground. And there's just so many hoops to jump through, so many things you have to do with the government, with the local government, with the EPA, yeah. and, and planning, and getting electricity. There's so many steps to the process that you got to plan ahead for two years from now, and you've got developers that are having to, they're paying millions and millions of dollars to get a subdivision up and running to the point where they can sell a lot. And, and so it's a big risk to them. And when we know we've got people coming in, they got to take a risk and assume they're going to sell a house. So, they're, I mean, we are we way under. Uh, there's an economist out of Nashville, Edsel Charles, that is a uh, new construction specialist. Uh, he's spoke in front of Congress, and, and I'm not here to give a commercial for Edsel, but he's he's good at at, at prognosticating the housing market. 
he predicted the 09 crash within two weeks. Um, he's according to him, and this was pre-Amazon, I bet he changes his thoughts. Amazon, according to him, we're not going to see a turnaround much until 2020 or 2021. And, and Amazon coming in with that many jobs may even change that calculation. Uh, and by the way, if any of you guys have any questions, please just interrupt and ask away. We're, that's what we're here for is help you guys uh, get the process nailed down. But back to where Sean was. Okay, so you've gone out, Sean found you the, the perfect house, you made an offer, countered back and forth, it was accepted, now you're under contract. Okay, now we have a closing date, we have a property address, we have a sales price, and we have, you know, if the seller's paying anything towards your closing costs or anything along those lines. Now we get back together. Um, if, we, if we had previously gotten documents, we may have to get them updated. Um, if it took two months to find that perfect house, we got to get new pay stubs and bank statements. Um, if it was two weeks, Sean's fail-proof plan worked so well, he found the, that first house you even looked at, which does happen, um, then we don't necessarily need to get any updated documents. If, if we didn't get any documents at all, we got to get all of them, okay? What will happen, we'll sit down, we'll do an actual application on the computer, fill the whole thing out, we track everything about you for two years. We got to know where you've lived for two years, where you've worked for two years. Again, we get the pay stubs, the bank statements, the tax returns, all that stuff. Um, we go through, sign the contract, talk about interest rate. Either y'all choose to lock the rate right then if you like it, don't, lo don't like it, or see if we can gain something and you play the market and smarter than Wall Street, go for it. We'll float it and see what happens. Um, but we get you rolling forward. Um, once we get all that completed, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of government interference or influence there. Things have to be done a certain amount of time, certain days for this, certain days for that. We get you turned into my processors. Okay, that, <coughs> excuse me, my processing team. Uh, the first steps they'll order the appraisal, they'll order the title work, um, they will order anything verification employment, verification rent, any of the verifications we have to do. Um, they do a whole lot of work on a computer that's no sense even going into, but there's a lot of work done on your file. We then will take what we have, which of course we won't have your appraisal or your title work back probably. By, you know, this is, we're talking this is within 72 hours, uh, maybe four days at the most. If, if there was a lot of paperwork, um, we had to get extra paperwork or uh, the client doesn't have their divorce degree, so we had to sit and wait for that. Um, Within two to four days, we turn you into our underwriters. Okay, underwriters, all loans, more or less all loans, go through the computer first. They're underwritten, it's called automated underwriting system. Different loans have different types, but they're all basically automated underwriting systems. And you'll go through that before we even get to, the, to, to this point. But then they're actually verified by a human underwriter and a decision is made. When that decision is made, it's one of three things. It's either denied, which means I did not do my job on the front end, you should have never been allowed to write a contract on a house, it doesn't happen very often. It is suspended, which means the underwriter's saying, I don't want to approve this loan, and I don't want to deny this loan because you forget to give me pay stubs, or something, they, there's, there's some documentation missing that that underwriter needs to make a decision. That doesn't happen very often either or it's approved with conditions. And what that means is this loan is approved and we are, and that's what Sean was talking earlier, a, a commitment to lend. At that point, we are, we are committing to you that we're gonna lend you this money based on these conditions. The appraisal's gotta come in right, the title's gotta be clear, uh, we missed page three of your bank statement because it was on the back and no one knew it, um, your driver's license copy wasn't clear, whatever they may, there may be with the file, it will be approved with conditions, okay? I call the client, go over them, say, okay, great, we're approved, ready to go, um, here's what we need. Well, we will take the time to get those, whatever's missing from the clients. Um, it, sometimes there's nothing, sometimes it's just, okay, who are you using for your homeowner's insurance? We gotta get that taken care of. Go ahead and call Blake and get it done. Um, get all that lined up. We try to have all that ready to go by the time the appraisal and the title work comes back in. We take all of that, 
<coughs> excuse me, all of that uh, a complete file, and we submit it back to the underwriter for final underwriting. Sometimes something comes out of final underwriting where um, I, I jokingly will say that mortgages is just like peeling an onion. You peel off one layer, and sometimes there's another layer there. Uh, you get an updated bank statement, and that's where you see the the child support payment. Or that's where all of a sudden there's a $10,000 deposit that we have to verify where those funds came from. Or we get the pay stub, and lo and behold, it's from a new company. Uh, did you change jobs? Oh, yeah, yeah. Did I not tell you that? No, you forgot to mention that you quit your job. Uh, so sometimes that, that is not quite final underwriting. Sometimes that's underwriting shot number two. But let's just say it's final underwriting. We come out, we're approved, we're ready to go. Then we go into the closing department. Okay. One of the things that's changed, if you have not bought a house in the last five years, is, again, it, everything the government has done to, to help the consumer is a lot of it's based on timeliness. We have to issue what's called a closing document or a CD. That CD has to be acknowledged by the buyer seven, a bare minimum of 72 hours before closing, or about three days before the closing date. So let's just say we issued you a closing document Today, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you close on Friday. So basically you have four days to wait. So we have to issue that CD, we get it acknowledged, we sit and wait for the day of closing, we get all of our documents over to, to Lisa, her and my closing department go back and forth and finalize the closing package, and then we all show up for the day of closing, which is the good part, and that's where I'll bring in the, 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 the fun part of the process. Well, before we get to that, let's take Blake to the homeowner's True, insurance. true. Uh, that's actually a good idea. Part of, part of my documents and my closing numbers are his numbers. And that's the insurance which we've got to have before we can do the final underwriting. So why don't you tell them how that goes. Right, yeah. So JR will have an, a, uh, an escrow analysis set up and an account set up for insurance and taxes. And part of that estimate is what he is anticipating the insurance and taxes to cost. He'll have that amount rolled into what he is estimating the mortgage payment to be. So let's say he's estimating your home insurance to be 1200 bucks a year. Uh, JR says, hey, I need you to contact your insurance company, reach out to them to figure out uh, the cost of insurance for this property. He'll also, at that time, verify whether or not the home you're buying is in a floodplain. Most of the homes in this area are not, but there are some. So with the floodplain, there's an additional policy that has to be purchased through FEMA and through the insurance company. So um, he'll have you reach out to your insurance company, and JR will probably also have you, to keep your insurance company honest, reach out to someone else locally to compare the price to, okay? So let's say you find your house on Main Street you're interested in, you've got everything set up for closing, and now you need the insurance. So you call either myself, I'm a local agent here in town, Liberty Mutual Insurance, over on Medical Center Parkway. Um, and let's say you've already called your current insurance company, have the rate, you give me a call and we do a comparison quote. What I have the ability to do is quote through Liberty Mutual, which is a top five carrier in the nation, and I also have several other carriers that I can quote with to make sure you get the best price, okay? So within that, um, we're gonna have to know the age of the roof, which the inspector will be able to figure out the age of the roof, and some of that information is in the property disclosure that the seller has, okay? So, we need to know the age of the roof, who's gonna be on the loan, personal information as far as date of birth, social security, and have you had any homeowners or renters insurance <coughs> claims in the past five years? Uh, as long as all that checks out, uh, we'll be able to produce a rate for you, and hopefully um, the numbers we produce fall in line with, uh, with what JR had for you on the estimation for your escrow, and then, as far as the go-ahead, we would just need to go ahead to send the information over uh, to JR for closing. Um, common questions as far as home insurance goes, you know, what separates uh, prices between a house in Woodbury or a house in Murfreesboro? Well, a house in Murfreesboro is probably a lot closer to a fire department than a house in Woodbury. Uh, traditionally, in more rural areas, uh, home insurance prices could typically be a little bit more based on response times to fire departments, fire hydrants, and things of that nature. Um, another thing is the age of the home. Sometimes if you have a house built in 1950 and it has old 
metal pipes, it's gonna, the insurance on a house in 1950 is gonna be more expensive than a new construction home. Typically, the best price on home insurance these days is gonna be on new construction, uh, but you can get a very affordable rate even on an existing home. Um, and as long as the home isn't in a floodplain, we don't have to mess with FEMA or do any of that. Uh, we can just produce the quote and get everything over. Now, we also have the ability of bundling. So, typically when he says, call your insurance company, he's wanting you to call whoever you have your auto insurance with, okay? Some people have GEICO with auto. Well, GEICO doesn't have local agents. And it's one thing if your auto insurance is still 1-800 number, but the last thing you wanna do is come home on a Friday night you walk through your door and your water heater busts and you have water everywhere. You don't want to have to call a 1-800 number for that. You want to be able to call your local agent, someone locally that you trust, to sort of help walk you through that process. What I would do if you call me on Friday night is I'm going to call my uh, water mitigation team or somebody locally here to come and start the drying process to help prevent further damage. And then we'll help you assess the situation to figure out if it's worth filing. If it's below your deductible, the last thing you want to do is call your insurance company or call the 1-800 number, and it turns out it was a $900 claim that was even below the deductible, and then that goes you goes against you in the future. Okay, so definitely some stock in, in being able to deal locally with a local agent. Okay, uh, but we also have the ability of bundling your auto insurance. That'll save you money on the home insurance as well. We also have the ability of handling life insurance as well. So. That way, if both of you are on a mortgage, something happens to your spouse, you're not having to sell your home and move out because something happened. We have uh, mortgage protection life insurance that we offer as well. Um, <clears throat> as far as anything else, I mean, uh, you know, everything else from at that point, uh, once we have the rate, we send everything over uh, to JR for closing, make sure it matches its numbers, make sure everything's going to work, and then you don't have to do anything else as far as insurance goes. You just mark that off your list of stuff that you have to do. Uh, any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, regarding the insurance, do you inspect the house before deciding how much the cost of the insurance, whether sure. it is old or new? Do you inspect Traditionally, it? no. Nowadays, we can pull pretty much everything off Google, pull everything offline if we need to. Uh, the home inspector uh, is part of what uh, JR Pool, you'll do a home inspection, so they'll come out and inspect the home for things. Some insurance carriers will do a drive-by exterior inspection. They just want to check for trees overhanging the roof, peeling shingles, uh, hazards, maybe five steps without a handrail, that's a liability. Things of that nature could happen uh, after the fact, depending upon which insurance company you go with, they may possibly do an inspection. But the insurance will cover anything, I mean, so not only the age, all the all the covered perils. So you've got uh, you, you've got your natural disasters as far yeah. as you know, you've got tornado, you've got wind, you've got hail in this area that's pretty prevalent. So it would cover all this. Yes, you've got uh, theft, vandalism, fire. Um, all of those things are covered. There are additional things that you can add to the policy that aren't typical in this area. For instance. Earthquake coverage, if, you, if you're buying a home in Memphis or buying a home in Tri-Cities in East Tennessee, you may possibly end up getting earthquake coverage because you're close to a fault line. Middle Tennessee, not so much. You may possibly get sinkhole coverage if you're on a larger piece of land and, and, and probable for sinkhole. Um, so there are optional coverages, but majority of losses that you would see are, are going to be covered under the policy. Very good question. So then, anybody hey, have any questions? Hey, Liz. Does all her policies have uh, replacement cost coverage, or is that something they have to ask for separately? Good question. So uh, back in 2011, insurance carriers in Tennessee, a lot of them had to go to what you would call an actual cash value basis if it is a wind or hail storm. So basically what that means is if your house is 15 years old and it's got a you know, a 15 year old roof on it. Well, traditionally, in, on a three tap shingle, it only has a 15 year life on the roof. Okay. So, what was happening back in 2009, 2010, 2011 is hailstorms where somebody would say, Oh, I need a new roof. Well, let's just wait for the next hailstorm to come through, and then I'll call my insurance company and they'll fork out a grant for the new roof. Well, 
eventually insurance carriers got smart with that and figured out, okay, well, we're going to give you full replacement on the front end, but once it's aged, if you have a 10-year-old car, we're not going to give you a 2018. They're going to depreciate. So there are insurance carriers out there that depreciate based on an actual cash value basis. What Liberty Mutual does is the first full 10 years of the roof's life will give you 100% replacement cost. Starting year 11, it does go to an actual cash value basis. Okay? So definitely recommend having your roof inspected when you buy a home. Make sure it's in tip-top shape. Uh, if there's any issues at all with the roof, definitely have that addressed uh, before deciding to write an offer on that, for sure. Well, what about a total home loss, like from fire? Yeah, yeah. So uh, if you have, a say, a total home loss with fire, typically the way they'll do that is you've got a coverage on your policy called loss of use. That loss of use coverage is going to allow you to be able to move out. We'll put you into a home comparable to what you're used to living in until your home can be completely rebuilt back to how it was before the incident occurred. So 100% full replacement cost on all rebuild, 100% full replacement cost on all your personal belongings. It doesn't matter if your TV's eight years old, we're going to give you whatever it costs to go out and buy that television brand new, okay? So they'll have you buy all your large items first, take care of all the big things first, and then you'll start piecing stuff together. One thing that Liberty offers is a Liberty Mutual Home Gallery app. On that Home Gallery app, you have the ability of actually going through your home and logging items uh, of record because you can imagine in living in a house for 10, 15 years, we accrue a lot of stuff. If we have a fire, total loss, there's no way we can remember everything that we've lost. Years. Now, most people, I, I did have a guy one time that he pulling out his sock drawer and taking a picture. I'm like, okay, man, I don't know if you want to pull out your socks and do all that, but all your, all your key items, your antiques, your, you know, your jewelry, um, and all your furniture, you know, whatever it costs for us to replace those items new is what, what we would pay. There are carriers out there that do it at a pre a depreciated value, so you definitely want to make sure you're getting 100% replacement cost on all your contents as well. Okay. Uh, there's also jewelry riders, so if you have uh, an engagement ring, a nice watch, or a necklace, or whatever that may be, you've got limited coverage on the home insurance policy to cover those items, uh, but insurance carriers do have the ability of scheduling those items if you have an appraisal. So we could insure uh, you know, your $10,000 ring and then if it gets lost or stolen, there's no deductible, okay? So you have the ability of doing that as well. Right. Can this home gallery app is on the app or is that on iPhone? It's on app uh, on iPhone or Android or whatever uh, kind of smartphone you have, it should be available. Okay? Do you want to think of anything else? And at that point, I turn it back over to, to JR. I've presented to him the quote and I've got him the, what we call the declaration page that's going to have uh, his loan number, the mortgage and clause for First Community on there, um, and it has what he needs on the insurance side for closing. All right. All right. Thanks. Now, we'll kind of we'll kind of backpedal just a little bit so Blake's got that. Then we send you to the underwriter and get final approval. Um, I kind of jumped in and forgot to, to include that part of the process. When we're done with all that, we make the phone call. Hey guys, it's great. We're ready to roll. We're closing on the 17th. You've already got your closing document or CD, and you've already acknowledged it. So now we're just waiting for the for the closing day. Uh, and then Sean steps in, and he's got a few more things he does with folks. Yeah. Well, actually, I'm going to rewind a little too. Uh, <laughs> Jason Peterson, the home inspector, just got here, so we're going to rewind. So uh, all the stuff with uh, Jr. has to be done within three days of your binding contracts. We get everything in writing, we get everything signed off, and within three days you have to meet with JR, fail your application, you can order the appraisal, everything like that. Well, in the contract we put days, how many days we are going to take to do our inspections. And when we're doing inspections, we're, we, you have the choice. Now all these inspections are optional. So you can do a home inspection, that way they're going to He's going to crawl up on the roof. He's going to go in the crawl space. He's going to look at your water heater, look at your HVAC system, look at your plumbing, look at your. He's going to check the house out top to bottom. 
Uh, you can get a termite inspection where the uh, bug people go out and see if there's any sign of any past termite damage or active termite damage. You can get radon tests where radon comes out of the ground and <laughs> poisons you. Uh, you can get, uh, if you're on well water, you want your well water tested. If you're on a septic system, you may want your septic system tested. These are all things that are optional on you. If you uh, in Tennessee, you do not have to have a survey to buy a piece of property. If you're buying in a subdivision, they have a registered plat. So you go up to the we I'll get you personally get you a copy of the, the registered plat and to show you this is what you're you got a hundred foot here, fifty foot here, there's an easement here. That that plat is registered. If you still want to get a survey, I have several partners that can do a survey, four or five hundred bucks, and you get pins put in and flags and they show you everything anyway. But if you're in a subdivision, the pins are already marked too. You may have to go get a metal detector, but they're there. So you have the choice to do all of these things. Uh, the, the one partner we brought in was Jason Peterson in the back. He's with Cornerstone Home Inspection. He can do the home inspection part of it, top to bottom check of the house. Now, when we do a home inspection, if you're buying a used house, new house, whatever, I tell every single client that is the best money you're ever going to spend to have that house looked at. Yeah. Because he may find stuff that you would have never thought of. I've seen him crawl in a hole that I don't think a mouse could have fit. <laughs> so he's going to go look at stuff that you're probably never going to put your eyes on, even if you owned the house for 30 years. So when he goes out there, he's going to look, find stuff, and he's going to give you a list. And his list even have videos on it. He may end up being in that little mouse hole, and he's going to be like, hey, it's Jason. I'm in this mouse hole. You see over here, there's some rot on your roof decking. Yeah, they did that today. See? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I'm going to let him come up here. I'm going to tell you what he does, and then we're going to fast forward because we got most of my contracts are right to have 14 days to have the home inspection. And what that means is we're going to have him do the home inspection. He's going to give us a list, and we're going to ask the seller to. We have three choices at that point seller, fix the stuff we want fixed. Seller, we're walking because there's too much stuff wrong. Or seller, we'll just buy the house as is. There's nothing that scares us away. So that's our choices. In that amount of time also, we're probably waiting on JR's appraisal to come back. If I did my job correctly, I should be in about range of what that contract's gonna look like. So when he sends the appraiser out, I'll even warn you, I'll, I'll even tell you, well, we got a multiple offer situation, we went, over appraise, we went over what I feel comfortable with, but in our market, we can kind of prove it because we, we can show appreciation. So, but we may have to look at something. When I represent you, Nine or hundred percent of the time, I'm going to tell you if a house doesn't approve, that it needs to fall on the seller to pay for the, the loss, not you. I, if, if that's what the house is worth, that's what I think you should pay for it. That's my that's my thing. I don't want to represent somebody that's paying more for a house than what it's worth. But I'm going to hand it over to Jason and let him talk about home inspections. How's everybody doing? All right. All right. Barely made it in time. I had a home inspection <laughs> on Dusty Springs. Got held up out there. I kind of felt bad though, I had a fancy button up shirt with my logo put on it and everything. I didn't have time to go get it, but I got my trusty hat for you. I don't really want to be wearing this on you. But. <laughs> okay, so a little bit about what I do, who I am, uh, what my field does for, let's say, you guys as new home buyers is typically I'm called within three main things that will happen. It would either be you purchase the home, you put in a contract, uh, it's time to get the inspections, we can move on with the things he was speaking. Also, if say you had a year-long warranty, you maybe want to you get the most out of that warranty. You holler at me ten or eleven months in, have me come in, put a little more clout behind the issues found, so we can have them speedily do it, and not kind of try to bully you on not making fixes. Or pre-inspection, if you're going to sell your home, uh, I deal with that a lot. Where someone maybe in one of y'all's shoes, uh, where you're going to sell your home, but you want to have your negotiating power. You want to be able to not just accept an offer and be like, man, I guess we'll take that. But that's the minimum we can do. Then have another one of me come in, tell basically like a big list of things. They ask for some things to get fixed that maybe you guys don't want to do. You don't want to have the, that room. So pre-inspection allows you that confidence going in. Like, you know, uh, a lot of times they'll even hand the inspection report from someone to the buyer or out at the table for people buying them. That way they know, you know, you just kind of know. You can be up front. Hey, there's certain things we didn't get fixed. This is the market. Take it or leave it, you know. Um, but anyway, uh, I run Cornerstone Home Inspection. I'm out of Murfreesboro. I work within about an hour radius from here. Uh, 
give or take. I want a little extra far today because it was with the realtor I work a lot with and it was just kind of doing a favor. Um, I work through realtors. They really do get me a lot of my work, but my client is my deal. I want to be on your guys' side throughout the whole thing. If you want to call me afterwards and discuss the things I found, I'm there for you. Uh, I load tons of pictures and videos of these reports so that there's a lot of confidence on um, what exactly we're even talking about. I'm sure Sean may have probably dealt with this before too, Brad too, uh, you know, before they had such a good inspector that, <laughs> that maybe they would do like a vague, a vague problem, like, oh, there's a, there's a, a problem with the storage waste underneath, and then it just gets written in a report, uh, gets written on the addendum that goes to the other side uh, for them to make that fix, and they don't even fix the right thing, and they don't really know what to do. I'm going to load it with full detail where there's no question on what we're finding. But now, the difference between getting an inspector and just say your cousin that knows construction or your uncle that runs a contract, a construction company or a contractor, uh, you need a home to train to eye. Whether it's me or not, just someone that has actual experience, years of experience, that can really find issues. Uh, it, it's kind of a detective work. Like I'll go in, I may see, I may see things that maybe aren't even as bad as you may think when you see them. There may be a little little stair step crack going down a foundation block outside the, the foundation of the home. They're like, oh, the structure's moving, the house is going to get up and run away. And it's really just a settlement crack. It's nothing. So I'm going to try to, I'm, I'm there to, to kind of keep you calm and help you know what to be concerned with at the same time. Uh, it's basically a big report card on the house. It's not intrusive. Uh, I'm not, uh, you know, digging in walls. I'm not damaging the home I'm at. But I'm going to check everything that basically I can do. Some guys go in two hours, two and a half hours. I'm there two and a half to sometimes four and a half hours. Like today, You've been one at seven for me before. Yes. Wow. Yeah, I'm not leaving. I, I, my philosophy personally is that it's as if I'm inspecting it for myself, my mother, a friend. I, I, I'm going to try my absolute best. Like That's what matters to me. Yeah, you've, you've, you've hired me for that day, not just for my little window where I can shove it in, get it done, and go to the next one. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get on the roof, unless I just physically cannot do it without breaking my neck. I'm going to check everything, but first I start out, let me slow down, I start out checking the outside. I look at the grade in the yard, I look at the exterior of the home, I'm looking at the siding, the windows, the doors, I'm looking at um, the, the, all the trim that goes over kind of underneath the roof's edge where the gutters are, I'm looking making sure the roof's draining well. Uh, I'm working my all around, uh, I'm also getting a bunch of stock photos of all the labels on everything, you know, your HVAC while I'm outside, I want to get a picture of that in the report in case you need to let a uh, technician know something at some point. I'm opening up the electrical panel outside, taking pictures of that, noticing if we have all the right wire, seeing if they did any like, scary add-ons, see if there's any danger kind of things, looking at the deck, looking at the, the shape of the wood. Uh, it's, and then from there I do the roof, and then from there I go inside, I do the whole interior, the kitchen, the bathrooms, the, um, the fireplace. I start checking the HVAC. I go through every component in the home, checking your water heater. Then I'm checking the attic space. Uh, checking all up and down wherever I can go. Legally, I only have to go where there's flooring, but I don't do that. I'm a Spider-Man through the whole thing. Uh, I, I went through one ceiling in my career. <laughs> I had a foot go through one time, but I, you know, that, didn't, that didn't stop me. You know, I just learned to pay better attention. I had the seller following me around. More power to him, nice guy, you know, explaining every history to everything in the home to me as I inspected it. Uh, I think he thought he was selling it to me, but anyway, he was like, literally crawling me, following me through the attic. I'm sitting there, I'm like, okay, you know, I did this turn, I kind of hit my head, and I was looking back at him, foot went right through the ceiling. But anyway, you learn, I pay top dollar to have that repair fixed, then we move forward. Um, but I'm going to check everything I can. I want to make sure there's no leaks coming under from anywhere, because it's not a matter of knowledge. What do you, say one of you, say you were a construction expert, or you were a construction expert for however long, you're still not looking for the things I'm looking for. Uh, me being a licensed inspector. Again, this isn't so much a, a pitch on me, but just how important it is you get an inspection. Because uh, I'm going to see a symptom, and then I'm going to think about the you know, thousand other houses literally I've inspected, and what that usually meant. And then I'm going to go from there and know that, oh, we have this little moisture stain here, and this is a 70s house. Um, you know, that very well could have been from the two roofs that have been on there since this roof, but I'm still going to make sure I check it out. I'm going to look at the roof decking above that, make sure there's no moisture stain in there, see if that was ever fixed. I'm going to look at the, uh, you know, uh, say it was on the edge of the home, I'll be in the crawl space. I'm going to note all these different areas to check. I'm going to run all your plumbing for a half hour before I even get under there. So make sure we don't, you know, find any leaks. Um, basically, it's just a whole, whole lot of things. The crawl space is kind of the biggie. Um, you know, every home, there's going to be usually some level of a little bit of a growth. 
you know, like nobody wants the big M word, moldy house, anything like that. But I'm there to kind of help gauge on how we're looking with that. It's something that's going to affect breathing if we should get a moisture specialist in there. Um, I'm not, a home inspector is not going to be your termite guy. If I see damage, I'm going to let you know. But you'll want to get a termite guy out there. They're, Ace is $35, you know, yeah, 35, 35 bucks they'll come out and they'll give you a termite letter anyway, which you'll need. Um, you know, septic, it's up in the air. I always tell people, I urge people to have that. I urge people to even still maybe even get an HVAC guy out there. I'm going to check it out, but they're going to be hooking up gauges to the inside of the HVAC and looking for Freon leaks and things that maybe aren't, aren't something I can detect right there in front of you. But I'm going to check that out if you don't go that route. I'm going to still be checking your temperature differences coming in and out and see how things are connected, how the ductwork looks. It goes on and on. But it, anyway, once that's done, your inspector will leave. I, uh, I would leave, and then I would go home and I would start typing the report. My reports, it's going to take a couple hours for me just to type them up. Usually uh, what you want is within a 24-hour window. I try to get it to you the same day whenever I can. Um, but you will get this report. So you're going to get an email from me that's going to have this link. You go into your report. My reports are server-based. Um, the reason I do that is so I can do videos, because not a lot of guys are doing that. I just feel like, again, if I'm in the crawl space looking at something and I'm in the corner, it's hard for me to film that way. It's not always the best angle, but I can really verbalize to you, vocalize what I'm doing, what I'm seeing, why I'm seeing that, instead of just two sentences of, oh, there's a bad floor joist, have a pro check it out. Uh, and, but anyway, that allows me to do that. But another plus I like, uh, I believe Sean's guys all use, I believe Brad, the guys I've done with, your clients use it too, that repair request feature. Mm -hmm. So after you look at the report, there'll be a link that says create repair request list. And it's going to pull up just the stuff I found, not the 30 pages you're going to get. Yeah. yeah. So instead of like all the, you know, a lot of realtors on the seller side don't want the whole report. Like they'll, they sometimes try not to look at it. But this makes it where they see just the issues. Anyway, so you as the client, you're now looking at item number one. Let's say of those 15 things, 20 things, 10 things. It'll show you an item that's going to say, uh, have them fix it, take care of the issue. Have uh, you accept it, like, oh, I'm not going to push for that, that's not a big deal, or I can deal with that, or I'm getting this house so cheap, I'm going to not ask for that. Or get monetary value. Like, you know, I want, that's going to need a new roof, but I'd like my guy to do it. Let's get 10 grand off. You know, and, then, and you go through it, it even has a little thing that tells you how done you are. And then when you get done with that, that can be sent right on over. Um, and Sean can, I don't know if you attach them with your addendum. I attach them with an addendum. Yeah, so they, what they have to send is an addendum uh, that basically says the wording from what they think I said, or maybe they copy it exactly, saying, hey, you know, this is what we want fixed. And they'll have like 10 things on a contract looking piece of paper. And then they'll ask for those things. They counter whether they'll accept it all or they'll do this, this, this. You know, um, but what this does is this attaches this to that. So they have, they can't get out of not hearing my wording and what we want done and how it looks and the picture and everything. No excuses. And then we go from there. And you'll hear when you're working with them that, uh, like a deal being contingent on a home inspection, which basically means by having the home inspection done, if that's negotiated that it's contingent to the home inspection, correct me if I'm wrong in my wording here, uh, it kind of gives you your leverage to, if all else fails, say it's just things that just really don't make you comfortable, no matter what's done, you don't want to stay there, <coughs> or you can get out of that deal. It's, you know, of course we want to see every deal happen. I mean, you wouldn't have got into it in the first place. But if we need to, it, it gives that, you know, because you have a state license guy saying this stuff. You're not just going, oh, I don't like the way it looks. I don't, I don't want to do that. You know, so, now I guess earnest money is kind of a, um, is that, that's not. If you if it fails the home inspection, you get out, you get your earnest money back. See, there you go. And just to clarify, uh, not to correct, Sean somehow knows everything. But, uh, you know, he said fail an inspection. Like, do know I'm not a pass or fail inspection. Like, it's not like I'm a codes guy. We want to make sure people know that. Fail by their, by your, exactly. by their standards. Exactly. I want to clarify that. But that is important because I've done inspections for people where, let's say there's four stairs going into the back of the home or the front porch, uh, and there's no handrail. There's no something to lean on going in there. Technically, four stairs or more you're supposed to have a graspable. I'm going to put that on there for safety, for liability, for your liability, uh, for down the road if someone ever got hurt. I want you to know about codes things so you can choose whether to address it. Uh, but that doesn't mean I'm failing your deal. Like you, whether they fix it or not, you can still buy whatever you want pretty much within means. You know, I guess FHA, there's certain things where 
certain loans. Yeah, you'd have a handrail. Yeah. Okay. You're getting a handrail. Yeah, you're getting a handrail. But I mean, you know, but, but, but that's the world we live in today. You know, it's a, if some solicitor even falls and breaks his neck on your front porch and you didn't have the right handrail, you can actually get sued for that. So I'm going to let you know all these things. I'm going to give you a big list. My job is to limit surprises, make it the least pop ups that can happen. We've all bought a used car or something where you're all excited and then the next day you kind of start seeing all the little nicks or you, you hear the shift in that you didn't hear before. It kind of, sometimes you feel a little down about it. I'm here to limit that feeling when you're doing the home, when you're buying a home. It's not that you, your home has to pass some perfect A test. Um, you know, I, I say start with the things that are going to make it hard for them to sell it to the next guy. You know, if we have a roof leak, if we have a plumbing leak, if we have a, a ton of growth underneath, if we have like cracked floor joists under the home, things like that. You know, these those are things that they know that they know good well on the other side. If their realtor has any experience, that the next me is going to see it for the next buyer, and it doesn't look good on anyone's listing if, if the house goes back on the market three or four times. So there's a little bit of reality that sets in on that negotiating there. But anyway, I rambled a whole bunch of stuff at you really fast. If, is there any questions or anything? Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, sir. In fact, uh, you know, inspection is very important. Uh, I mean, for the houses. For you, I mean, uh, buy a house or rent a. I, I don't know this uh, inspection you do for both. I mean, new construction or new houses and old houses, or is it just? Uh, I would do it on both. Yeah, I know. For both. Well, that's a great question. Uh, and there's a, a lot of realtors that maybe won't tell people to get it done, but they won't really push it. But I'll tell you this: um, the reason some don't is because the thought is there's a warranty usually in place. I believe it's law. If it's a new construction by um, Tennessee law, you have one. So th there is a warranty in place, but for example, I inspected a home where on the back roof, really it's like a four or five hundred thousand dollar house, big huge nice house, but on the back roof, uh, over the over like the garage and bonus room area, there was just a hole, right in the roof, right right above where the living portion is too. So basically, any rain was just going to pour into the attic. Uh, and my thing is, is, okay, let's say we have a warranty. They will end up fixing something. But when do we know to fix something? Yeah. When we see a symptom. Yeah, and once you see all that, there could be water down the wall. There could be all these things that that, real, that warranty company isn't going to try to make, always make it exactly like new. They're going to just fix it enough. Yeah. So it's just, and who wants I, I've got a really horror story. <laughs> I sold six houses, brand new constructions in the same neighborhood. We closed them all the same month. Brand new constructions. All three, all, all six of their foundation shifted before closing, yeah. even even while they were less than 30 days old. What was wrong? Was there a lot of rain? No, they just shifted. They, they, <coughs> it, we finally figured out that the pressurized concrete wasn't the right pressurized concrete, okay. and the, the foundation shifted. If it wouldn't have been for the home inspector, the same home inspector did all six of those houses and found all six of them. So yeah, it, maybe there is an authority, I mean, before the developer can sell these houses, there is authority to, to inspect. Well, they, they have, during the construction process, you have uh, pre-mechanical, mechanical, pre-drywall, pre uh, post-drywall, final walkthrough. But those guys, those guys that are inspecting that for the government, they're not looking for finite details or anything. They're just making sure that whatever system they're specifically looking at, they're making sure that specific system is working. And they're through their checklist. They're, they're, they're working through a punch list, and they're just going down that punch list, making sure all the T's are crossed and I's are dotted. They're not necessarily looking that, oh, this has got a crack, this has got a crack, or this doesn't work. They just want to know whatever they're inspecting is working. Like uh, I spoke a little bit earlier about connecting the dots. A lot of the job is, is sort of being a detective with it. Uh, you know, I, for, like what he's saying, where they're looking for that one thing, I may see a symptom for a whole other guy's job that he did wrong that connects this other thing that the electrician did into being a way bigger deal. Mm -hmm. I'm piecing it all together and basing it all right. that. And with new construction, you'll see a lot where my dad built homes for years. That's kind of what triggered me into doing this sort of work was that so much of that job, the reason most of the new builds never finish on time, ever, 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 is because <laughs> is there's always the one guy, if it's a good builder, they are trying to make sure it's in the right order. You may need your plumber to do something before you have this guy do something. You may need your roofer to do certain things before the siding guy, you know. I'm not giving you accurate examples, but there's an order to how things go. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, so, yeah. I mean, uh, when you are doing the inspection, you have a team or just yourself, because you said edge back you are not doing but there is electrical, there is uh, plumbing, you know, sanitary, all these things. You have technical team, I mean, to respect these things, or you yourself uh, do all the things. 
I do all those things. I just, uh, the term non-intrusive is an important one, and that's what a home inspection is. I'm not here to blow smoke about what the detail of what I'm doing. As far as with HVAC, I'm looking at functionality. functionality. I'm looking at, like I'm using infrared thermometers to check the temperature coming out, the temperature going in, making sure we have a healthy gap, for example. I'm looking at the duct work, making sure there's not leaks around there. I'm looking at uh, whether the right shutoff valves are in place. I, honestly, it's a lot of things where when the HVAC guy comes, he won't mention those kinds of things. But they're checking for the where they take apart the unit. There's a little more of a, a delve into there. Well, some of them. You have to ask good questions of who those guys are you hire, because some of them don't do much. They don't, you know. Um, but I just make sure people know you're free to have as many detailed inspections as you want. It can just, uh, I'm giving you a general report card where you'll know whether you should get the plumber out, whether you should or whether, hopefully on their dime, they get the, the plumber out. But uh, after inspection, you, you don't, I mean, uh, do any required repairs or so? Or we we ask the seller, the if, if there are repairs needed, that's, that goes back to me. He's going to give me a list of repairs that are needed, oh, yeah. and you and I are going to sit down and go, okay, repairs one, two, and three are really okay. I don't care about those. But four, five, and six, they have to be done. And we go back to the seller and say, look, for us to buy the house, you have to fix four, five, and six. And usually, I negotiate a little bit of that. I, 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 Ask for everything and whittle back to what you want. He's but, good. <laughs> yeah, he uh, some realtors are scared to ask for things. You know, it's, yeah, it's true. I mean, some. Shoot, I throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I, think, I think some realtors are more concerned about getting the deal closed and not making waves than they are making sure the client gets what they need to pay for. Such a good point. Such a good point. And, and you'll never see that from anybody in this room. Right. That's where experience can play a part with that, too. Uh, not, now, that's me reaching a little bit, but just when I'm thinking of a guy that's a new realtor that's maybe like finally got himself a client, 70% of Nashville realtors are in their first year. That's scary. You know, it's, it's, people realize it's a hot market. I believe that number's right. That's what it, I heard that two weeks ago. Yeah. Okay. You, when, but, when you ask about the, like the codes and the government people as far as checking on stuff, perfect example is we had a, an, un, an unnamed subdivision with an unnamed builder that was building a new construction house that passed the foundation, the footer foundation codes inspection, and I believe it was when they came out, the, the guy, the codes guy came out for the wiring, um, he was looking at something else to find out that the house was about 10 feet too close to the road, and they could not put the septic tank that was designed to go in the front yard, they literally could not even put the septic tank in there because there wasn't enough room. So the builder had to pick the house up, build a new foundation, move it 10 feet back, and set it back down. Wow. Yeah. Well, that house was moved. Wow. What's that? The house was moved. FHA won't cover that. Yeah, they, I mean, it's, they, there's, I mean, but there's the, there's the local government he was more right or wrong. I, I, I'm not laying any blame for the, the codes guys, but he was checking to make sure the foundation was done correctly. Mm -hmm. But one of the things he's supposed to do is measure to make sure it was put in the right place as well, and that part just never happened apparently. Yeah. I mean, in fact, uh, I have the same I, when I was working. That is during construction inspection, but after construction, before even selling the house or so. There is a building completion certificate which should be given to the seller in case of all the things has been inspected. There is an inspection team about maybe 10 to 15 uh, person to cover it electrically, mechanically, uh, sanitary, uh, HVAC, everything, everything inspected. And after that, they give him a certificate. A certificate of occupancy. Yeah. Completion certificate. Yep. They call it. Well, what he, he basically goes through and he compiles. Let's say you've got 10 different inspections. He compiles the 10 different inspections and goes, yes, that one's good, that one's good, that one's good, that one's good. Yeah. Kind of walks the thing and goes, okay, yeah, it's all good. I steal it after that. I mean, and like I said, these, these inspections are optional. I am telling you, for, as a realtor that's been in the market business a long, long time, it's still worth hiring him just to make sure that he may not find anything. 
Well, no, I, I'm honest. I'm yet to find the perfect house. <laughs> I, I've literally done about a thousand. There is I've not a perfect house. house. I've never, I, honestly, the new ones, I get just as many items. I, 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 I averaged it because I was, I was curious. I was kind of nerdy of me, but I, I pieced together. I find about, I think, 60 or 70 percent of what I normally would on like an 80s or 90s house in a brand new house. It's different kinds of problems. But, and I, I'd be more than happy to, uh, I can send you some reports from new constructions I've done. It, it, it'll surprise you the things that don't get done right. Yeah. Uh, I've had I've furnaces heard. that just completely were like uh, connected wrong. It was just pouring water out. It I've, got a, running. I've got a story with a new construction that when the plumber did the plumbing, when he tied in the sewage line to, to take the sewage line out, he disconnected another part of the sewage and all the waste from every plumbing device in the house was just dumping in the crawl space. Oh. And, and it, pa it passed. It passed. And it passed. Yeah. yeah. Now, 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 I, I don't look for cosmetic issues. If there's a scratch in the paint, if there's uh, something that's just totally now, now, if we're going to new construction, I'm extra picky for you, just because I feel like they're going to fix it. If it's a new construction, you deserve to have that. You know, like whatever it may be. And I'll. That's where some sometimes people think I'm. You know, it's a new bill. Give me a discount. It's a new house. I've, I've had realtors, even friends, that kind of work me like that. I'm like, man. I'm, if anything, I'm more paranoid when it's new because I don't have symptoms to go off of. If we have a leak, I can't see it yet. I didn't have a chance to put a big ugly stain on the on the ceiling yet. I haven't had a chance to see. So, uh, so I'm looking. I'm really going to go over five, with a fine tooth comb on that. Um, but but seriously, I'd be more than happy to. Uh, we can trade info later. I could show you some of my reports on some new constructions, and you'll see a lot of things. Thank you. Uh, for your example, the fact that it's, there was a very big building, mm -hmm. you know, it was destroyed, totally destroyed, mm -hmm. because of the same thing you said. There is a pipe, drainage pipe, before reaching the manhole, only about four inches. Mm -hmm. Less. He, they, he left it, the, the drummer left it, and all the uh, water coming to the soil. Mm -hmm. The soil which was of the type that expands when it receives water. So gradually the soil expanded and destroyed the building, the whole yeah. building down. I, I've seen Because it. of such uh, a mistake. And it passed, the house I'm talking about passed uh, government inspection. <laughs> <laughs> So, so now that J Jason's done, we've negotiated all your repairs, uh, JR's done, he's got all your loan stuff done, we've got appraisal done, uh, Blake's got your insurance done, now you're finally ready to be homeowners. And we're going to turn you over to Lisa, and she's going to sign your docs, tell you what to, where you're going to send your money to, and then you're going to be homeowners, so I'll turn it over to Lisa. Thank you guys. Thank you. No more questions, right? Is there any other questions? Okay. Well, I'm going to put in a plug for him for the new construction mill. I had a closing last week that was a new construction, brand new house, and they had hired a home inspector. And the home inspector found a few things. Some were major, some were not so major. But that new homeowner wound up walking because that builder would not fix all the things that was on the list. It's a brand new house. So, you know, nothing should, while well, there's no perfect house, you know, you're supposed to be as close to perfect as possible when it's brand new, you know. And some of these things were pretty major in my opinion. So, uh, the one thing, another thing I want to put in a plug for is, several people talk about this, is local. Go local with your, of course, home inspector, your insurance agent, your lender, of course, your realtor. Do not call 1-800-QUICKEN LOANS, okay? or any of those online loan companies or insurance companies because when you have a problem, you want somebody that you can go see face to face and things happen. Like Blake talked about, you know, if you have a, a problem with your insurance, like if you have a plumbing leak, you know, you don't want to call a 1-800 number, okay? Or during your loan process, you want to be able to talk to somebody local, go see them if you need to. It's okay talk on the phone, it's okay do things online. But you want somebody that you can go to local. Before I get started talking about what I do, um, I know we've got four people here. Are, are you new home buyers? Have you ever owned a home before? Or this is your first, this will be your first purchase when you buy? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm usually the last person you see in the closing process. Uh, after you've picked out your dream home and got your home inspection done and got your insurance in place and got your loan all approved, I'm usually the last person. 
Uh, I'm Lisa Turner with Bataga Title. We're locally owned and operated. We're over on Memorial Boulevard, off Memorial Boulevard. Uh, I have a little cheat sheet here. I'll forget to mention some things that are important. But um, I've been in the business about 32 years. So I, I kind of tell people sometimes that I'm beginning to be older than the dirt I sometimes am sure. So, <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, been in a long time. And our underwriter that we use is Old Republic National Title Insurance Company, which is one of the top three national, Old Republic, uh, one of the top three uh, title underwriters. So you want to choose somebody that has, you know, you can Google them and they'll tell, they'll tell you all about them. But, uh, your, under, your title underwriter, you want to choose somebody with good financial strength so that if you have any kind of underwriting title claim, they have the money to pay that claim. But, um, so our underwriters are Republic. Uh, do you know what title means? You ever heard the term before? I know you've heard about the title to your car, okay? The title to your car says you own that car, right? It's in your name. Well, the title to a house is your evidence that you own that house, okay? And when you've gone through the process, and you, I'm not sure exactly what point um, the in your loan process that it's sent to me, but they'll send me a title order request after you've been pre-approved and you signed your contract and all that. They'll send me a title insurance uh, order request telling me the property that you're purchasing, and they'll send me the contract that you've signed so that I know what all your terms are and stuff. And then we search the title. We go back 40 years when we do a title search. That means we're searching the title to the property of your seller that's selling you the property and 40 years behind that seller. They may have owned it for only five years. We go back 40 years. Uh, usually if we go back 40 years, if there's any kind of title defect, it's going to show up in a 40-year title search. Um, an example of some things that can make a title defective is when you come to closing, we ask for ID, okay, to make sure that you are who you say you are. And so, fraud or forgery involved in the chain of title, because when we search, when we do a title search, we're searching the courthouse records, showing, like if you're a seller of Smith, and Smith bought it from Jones, and Jones bought it from Davis, we're going through all those ownership records to pull in deeds to see who owned it before you, if they, if they created any easements on the land, if they signed into an easement agreement with somebody. So we're, we're going back several years. So, uh, so we're searching public records and we can't tell if there's any fraud or forgery involved in that chain of title. That's one of the things that a title insurance policy will cover. Um, when we do a title search, it pulls stuff like if there's any easements on your property. Okay, uh, that's important to know. Um, there's two types of title insurance. There's owner's title insurance and there's lender's title insurance. If you get a loan with JR, he's going to require title insurance that you purchase your lender title insurance. That means it's important if your lender's requiring it. Owner's title insurance is optional, but I wouldn't buy a piece of property anywhere without buying the title insurance. Uh, because unlike homeowner's insurance, is a premium that you pay on a regular ongoing basis. Um, or any of the any other type of insurance product, life insurance, auto insurance, you're paying it, you know, quarterly, monthly, annually. Well, title insurance you pay one time, and that's when you buy the property. You pay the one-time premium, and you never have to purchase it again. And I'm talking about owners now. Uh, it's good for as long as you own the property. If you ever sell the property in the future, it is not transferable to a new buyer. They have to purchase their own. But it's good for as long as you own it. Now, your loan policy that you have to purchase for JR is only insuring that loan. So as long as that loan is in place, that loan policy is good. But if you pay that loan off and refinance and get another loan at some point in the future, you would have to purchase another lender's policy. Um, okay, uh, when we do a title search, we'll pull stuff, like I said, easements and restrictions. If you buy a house in a platted subdivision, then that subdivision's already been surveyed, like they talked about earlier. Uh, and there's a recorded plat in the Register of Deeds office showing the dimensions of the lot you're buying. But if you buy an acreage tract, um, who knows how long it's been since that acreage tract has been surveyed. We, sometimes we can tell when we do the title search because we can tell by the legal description. It will be what we call a meets and bounds legal description, like so many feet north, so many degrees north, so many degrees south, ending in 5.01 acres. According to survey by some named surveyor, uh, dated 
whatever date. So sometimes we can tell by the legal description how that survey is. And if it's a fairly recent survey, probably not, a, you know, probably not necessary for you to get another survey done. But if it's an old legal description, like really old, where it just says it's founded on the north by Smith, on the south by Jones, on the east by so-and-so, and on the west by so-and-so, and you don't really know how many acres you're buying, you need a survey. Uh, sometimes the legal descriptions, if they're really vague, we, have, we require a survey before we can ensure the title to your property. Uh, because we've got to have a beginning point and an ending point. We've got to know what we're insuring, title-wise. So keep it in mind if you're buying acreage. Uh, if you're buying into a subdivision, uh, most subdivisions have restrictions on that subdivision, meaning they're restricting what you, you, you can do with your own property. Like, for example, um, the restrictions on new subdivisions restrict what type of house the builder can build, like what size, if it has to be brick versus vinyl, if it has to be a paved driveway or if a gravel driveway is fine or a concrete drive. If it has to have a two-car garage or front-facing or rear-facing or side-facing, those are restrictions. And in those restrictions, it'll also talk about uh, fencing, for example. You, you may buy a house and it not have uh, a backyard fenced in, but you may want to add that later. Well, you need to look at the restrictions to see because the restrictions will allow for only certain type of fencing, okay? Um, so you, you want to look at those restrictions. And if you want to look at it before you sign a contract, like Sean can always, you know, contact me and I can usually pull those um, and get you a copy of them before just so you can see what those look like. Um, also with easements, sometimes it's good to know about those in advance. I had a closing once several years ago. Although this was very visible, it had a TVA easement that went across one corner of the property. You know what the TVA lines look like, the big electrical lines? I mean, they're very visible and very obvious on a piece of property. Well, the title work showed that it had that. And when they went to look at the property before they signed the contract, they should have been able to see that. But when I was going over the title work at closing, they didn't they didn't realize they had it, so they, they walked because they didn't want a piece of property, the easement going across their property. So sometimes it's good to know what the title looks like before you buy, okay? Um, now, usually you won't see or talk to me until your closing gets set. But here are some, some things that we need to know about you um, when you're getting your loan and, and before you come closing. I need to know your marital status. Okay? You may be married. But you may, your spouse may be a stay-at-home spouse. No income doesn't work, so the loan is only in your name because you're the one, only one that has income. Well, that doesn't mean your spouse doesn't need to come to closing because your spouse does. Because under Tennessee law, spouses have marital interest in real property, so they would have to sign the deed of trust or mortgage that you get through JR. So we need to know your marital status. You need to get your homeowner's insurance in place because that, that usually is in place for boards you know, ever sent to me. So you'll have to get your homeowners in JR. <coughs> and JR will talk about your cash to close. He'll give you some preliminary numbers on the front end. You know, you'll have to bring 15000 approximately 15000 to close. That's your down payment and closing cost, okay? When when your loan is approved and it's gone through all this process that they've talked about and, it's, and we schedule a closing date, then I work hand in glove with the lender to tweak those numbers to get them final. We're pulling stuff like getting your homeowner's insurance debt paid and page to make sure we're collecting the right premium. If you've got the termite inspection, which I also, you know, recommend that you always get a termite inspection because uh, it's money well spent, then we're making sure we get that, that on the closing statement. We're gathering all these numbers and figures so that we can pull together your final number of cash to close. No matter where you close at, every title company will have some restrictions on what type of funds you bring to closing. I'll tell you what my title company's uh, requirements are, and I think probably the majority of title companies here in town are the same. If it's less than $500, we'll take a personal check. No cash, don't bring cash to close it. <laughs> bring a personal check. If it's $500 up to uh, 900, $9,999, we'll take a cashier's check. Anything 10,000 or greater has to be a wire transfer. Don't let the word wire transfer scare you because if you have to get a cashier's check, you're having to go into your bank, go up to a counter and say, I'm buying a house, I, I need $5,800 from my savings account in the form of a cashier's check payable to Pataka Tiger. And they'll, you know, pull up your account information, 
and go print you a cashier's check for that amount. Well, a wire transfer is pretty much the same. Instead of going to the counter, you would probably go to somebody at a desk and say, you're buying a house and I need to send a wire transfer to my closing company for the, my cash to close. And then you'll sit down and they'll fill out a form. You, you'll get what's called wiring instructions from me, which is our bank account information that I need you to send the money into, okay? And you'll be giving them, your bank, the wiring instructions and telling them what amount that you need to wire to your title company to buy your house. And anytime you, you need to do that in advance of closing. Like if you have a closing schedule for say 10 a.m. on Wednesday, you need to be doing this on Tuesday. And you'll get your final numbers usually at least 24 hours in advance of closing. So you need to do that the day before so it didn't hold up your closing. Because the funds has to be there in our account by the time you finish closing or we can't give out money to your seller. And sometimes if you don't give out money to a seller, they don't give you keys. So it all kind of has to work hand in glove. Um, you need to work with your uh, realtor to schedule a, a date and time for your closing. Like your contract may say, close owner before December 15th. That doesn't mean you're closing on December 15th. It means you're going to close on or before December 15th. So whenever, you know, ever all your ducks are aligned and you've got your loan and insurance and all that and you're ready to close, you need to get with your realtor to call me and schedule a time and a day for your closing. It may be on December 15th, but we need to set a time because, you know, there's eight hours and a work day on December 15th, so we need to schedule a time around your schedule and what I have available. Um, we talked about funds, we talked about scheduling. Okay. On the day of closing, if you're buying a home and getting a, uh, a mortgage loan, you can expect to be there about an hour signing. Depending on the type of loan uh, you get, you know, FHA loans, government loans, you have a lot of paperwork. You know, a lot of it's repetitive. Some things you've already signed once for JR, you sign again for me at closing time. But you can plan on being there for about an hour. Okay. Uh, we welcome children, of course. I know a lot of people have children that can't find a sitter for their children. So I have a little corner with little toys and stuff for children to help occupy them, but uh, children are always welcome, so, uh, and plan on being there for about an hour. We need to bring, bring ID when you come. Like, your driver's license is what we usually ask for, and it needs to be unexpired, so take a look at that, because I can't tell you how many times somebody's come to my closing table to buy a home, and the driver's license is expired. So they have to go to the DMV and get it renewed, because I have to have an unexpired photo identification. And JR talked about the closing disclosure. It has lots of information on it that he'll send a minimum of three days in advance of closing. Uh, a lot of it is your loan terms that y'all have already agreed to. And, a lot, and then the rest of it is your uh, closing numbers, your cash to close, that make up your cash to close. Now what I gave you in the handout is a, an example of a settlement statement of a closing I did just this morning uh, that gives you an example of some of the fees. As a buyer, your fees are on the right hand side of, of the settlement statement. And it starts, you know, it's got debits and credits called. Credit is money you've paid or, or a credit you're entitled to. Debit is what you owe. Okay? So it's got your sales price, an, an example of a sales price and a loan amount on there. Uh, you know, it's got prorated taxes. So when I'm talking about the property taxes, you, you're, you're being given credit for whatever earnest money you might have paid up front with the with the contract, uh, <coughs> sometimes in your contract, the seller is paying part of your closing costs. In this example, I think the seller was paying six thousand in closing costs. So that helps you with your closing costs. That's a credit to you on the closing statement. That's where you see that the seller's not really giving you a check, we're giving you a credit, which reduces the amount of money that you bring to the closing table, and we're subtracting that same amount from the seller's proceeds. Uh, the seller's numbers are on the left-hand side, but. You know, you'll see on the seller's side, if there's any mortgages or liens on the property, we're paying that off for your seller. We're paying your real estate, the real estate commission. Usually, the, the typically the seller always pays the real estate commission. Uh, so you won't see that on your side, but you'll see your loan, some examples of loan cost, uh, what we call prepaids, which is your homeowner's insurance to play. Um, and then you're setting up your escrow account with your lender for taxes and insurance when it comes to you again. And time we get to the bottom, we add a you know, all the debits, all the credits, and that's where we come up with your cash to close number. I think in this example, the buyer's cash to close number was $8,500. And it may continue on that second page, I think, is the cash to close amount. 
But that $8,500, for example, it's over the $500, but below the, but below the $10,000. So he brought a cashier's check to close him for that $8,500. Um, and I know, you know, it can be stressful, the buying the home, the new home process, but if you get with the experts, like you've, you've heard talk here tonight, you know, that's been in the field a while, they can answer all your questions and lead you through the process. And my job is the end job. You know, we do the, all the legal paperwork connected with buying the home and getting the loan and searching your title to make sure when you do buy this new home, you're not buying somebody else's problems. A lot of times when we do a title search, there's defects. And if there's defects, you know, I'm calling JR and I'm calling Sean and I'm telling them, well, the seller's got an issue. Some of the issues might be, a prior unreleased lien on the title from a prior owner in title. Well, we've got to get that released and taken care of before you buy it because you're buying somebody else's problems, if not. And your lender's not going to make a loan on it without having a, a first mortgage priority lien status on your home. Excuse me. Yes, uh, sir? You say you're from title company? Yes, sir. The company. For yep. title for the car, this is government traffic department or so for the title of the house, it's, it's a company to give the title of the house. Yeah. The title me, is, I don't know okay, the, the title is yeah. for we go back and search yeah. the ownership of the yeah. home, yeah. Of, of, the, of the home and the dirt that the, that the home sits upon, from people that have owned it before you, your seller, and back down the line, it might, you know, back to, like I said, we go back 40 years, so people that have owned it for you, for you. And we're searching to see, every time it changed hands, did that person have a mortgage on it? And if so, did that mortgage get released when it got sold to this person and owned down the line? And it's not registered in the government? I mean, there is no municipality or so that... When it gets registered, it goes to the government. Sorry? Yeah, when we close, and you sign, the seller signs the warranty deed, conveying title to the real property and the home that sits on that real property to you, that deed gets recorded in the Register of Deeds office, the local Register of Deeds office. When you get your mortgage from JR, that mortgage called a deed of trust, that also gets recorded in the Register of Deeds office. Those two things are a public record. Yeah. So that anybody can see that you bought a home and that you got a mortgage on it. And also for the you said there is a survey of to put the corner of the house or the well, that, 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 that That's on new construction, they do the survey? Or they yeah, survey yeah. It. When a house is built, it's surveyed. Yeah. And rarely past that is it is a survey done. Right. It used to be that we, you could you could get one done and, and, and we used to call it, have a short form, a long form survey. And FHA required that one be done, but it was on paper. No one even went to the house. They just copied down what was already written down, so it was totally useless. Most people don't choose to have a survey done only because they're, it's a typical subdivision lot. It's still going to run you eight, nine hundred to a thousand dollars, if not more. Mm -hmm. And unless you're wanting to put a pool up or a fence or, you know, even if it's off three or four feet, it doesn't matter. You might want to know where it is. You got a real good idea. But unless something's going to go on that property line, if you're a foot over a foot on the other side when you mow your lawn, it's, no right. it's not worth spending a thousand dollars. I think it's important. I mean, to know the you can, I mean, you can the borders your, of my house. Yeah. The reported the house. flat that he's talking about is where the the subdivision as a whole. Yeah. Say we had a 30 acre track of land that a developer has developed it into 30 lots. You know, they're yeah. one acre lots. Yeah. When when he developed it, it got surveyed. Yes. And each lot got surveyed into whatever size that lot is. And that recorded survey, called a plat, is recorded at the Registered Deeds Office so that you can see if you buy a lot 50, what the dimensions of your lot is. Exactly. And it'll say if you go four degrees to the east, 150 feet, you can, you can map it out yourself right. a string if you want. And, right. you, and you can find the pins. You know, yeah, the, the subdivision, the pins are there. Right. So you, you can actually yeah. go find the pins. They're four to six inches deep. Right. And you can find them pretty easily. You, I, I you had to find them in my house when I put my fence up. You don't necessarily need to pay a surveyor to come out and survey Not if you're buying a, a lot in a yeah. flatted subdivision. Now, if you're buying an acreage track, like I said, it depends on how old the last survey was that was done. You know, if there's some type of question, if the, sur if the seller says, well, I'm paying taxes on 20 acres, but I think I only have 15. 
or, yeah. or the deed refers to the uh, the big oak tree on the corner, you might want to know yeah. that oak tree's not there anymore. Yeah. Those oak trees kind of go, <laughs> you know. But if you were buying She's an acreage problem. track, I would look at the legal description when we get our title work back and see how old our legal description is and see if we have, you know, see if it's an insurable legal. You know, because there's a lot of legals that we get back that are not insurable without a new survey. You know. But that, that would probably be the only time I would spend money on a survey is that if I was buying an acreage track. So it's not a lot in the subdivision. Now, is that just kind of nationwide, so to speak? Because I had a. Um, Every state has different rules on surveys. Yeah. Right, because, well, I don't think it was necessarily a rule, but I saw the pastor guy that was from Texas, and he was like, I'm not, you know. What about the survey? Well, some states require a survey, an actual guy with surveying equipment right. to go to the right. property and measure it out. Some states require it. Te so Texas, is actually, not. Texas is actually yeah. a goofy real estate law. Not in a bad way, but they have some different laws out there. Um, Texas, up until a few, like seven or eight years ago, you couldn't even do a second mortgage. Um, wow. Texas, you had what's called a mud tax. So you have an extra tax on your property. There's several things in Texas, land-wise, that's just totally different than any other state. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, it just as that that state is an example. Right. What and all the land's bigger in Texas. Yeah. That's right. That's right. One acre out there is equal to half an acre here. So it's wow. all here. <laughs> One of the things I forgot to mention is when you're looking for your dream home with Sean, you need to to. Uh, find out if that subdivision that you're looking at has homeowners association use. But that's a big too, because if there's a homeowners association, they also limit and restrict what you can do with your own property. And you have to pay fees up front uh, at closing, when you come to my closing, and you have to pay dues either monthly or quarterly or annually. So check to see if there's a homeowners association set up for your subdivision yeah. or wherever you're buying. Any other questions? Thank you. All right, congratulations. Yeah. You're now homeowners. Yeah. The process is over. You can clap your hands. Yeah. <laughs> You've heard from industry professionals and one, two, three, four, five different real estate industries all tied together. And we like to think that we all work in a perfect cog, that everything rolls and everything's smooth. We can mitigate all the stress we can. We fix some stuff without ever you even knowing that we fixed it. But there's, there, it, the real estate buying process can be stressful. So we try to relieve the stress as much as we can, but it can be stressful. The one thing that I can guarantee you from everybody sitting in this room is everybody sitting in this room communicates very well. So if you if there is a stressful situation, nobody's going to go hide and duck their heads in the sand and be like an ostrich. They're, they're going to answer your questions. They're going to be face to face with you, and you're going to be good to go. Uh, everybody's talking about using people that are local. We've got five local professionals that we love during your business. If you have any questions for us all, uh, just let us know. We'd be glad to help you out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming.